Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I am Shane Moss, and my guest today is a journalist and science writer who I've been trying to get on the show for months now. We've been uh, having a little back and forth via Twitter and email and such. Uh, she's the author of the book, The Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first four years. Also, a new book coming out in uh, December, I believe, right, Emily? Yeah, that's right. And uh, maybe we'll have her back on to talk about that. The Tailored Brain, From Ketamine to Keto to Companionship, A User's Guide to Feeling Better and Thinking Smarter Today. Oh my gosh, drum roll, please. Longtime listener of the show, you, you may have heard me on as a guest on other podcasts and someone that's heard me on uh, on the right podcast will probably think, Wow, this guy has a very peculiar interest in animal genitalia and and knows an odd amount about it. Um, and it's it's a fascinating subject that isn't just kind of silly and goofy to hear about or whatever, but also is just mind blowing what you can learn about life itself from animal genitalia throughout the animal kingdom, believe it or not. And so we're talking about her brand new book, Fallacy, a Life Lessons from the Animal Penis. Thank you so much for joining me, Emily Willingham. How are you Thanks doing, Emily? Me. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, let's get into it. Tell people, first off, why did you decide to write a book about uh, life. Le oh, actually, you want to play my favorite game first? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> you have to let me know what that is. The game is where I have a thing that I think is um, correct, a sensibility that I think is correct. And I'm going to see if you share the same one. So what we're going to do is on the count of three, we're both going to say our favorite penis in the animal kingdom. And... Can we stipulate non-human animal? Non-human, of course. Non-human okay. animal. Okay. Um, and you got one in, in mind? Sure. I I know what I'm... So we'll see if you're right or not, because I know mine is correct. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> all right. One, two, three... Damsel CP. fly. I knew you were going to say one of those. Yeah, it's the, it's the popular one, right? Is, right. It, is it cliche, the damsel fly? You know, not uh, so much. Most people say duck, right? They're very invested yeah, in duck the corkscrew. The corkscrew. Sure. Yeah, I have. I just really like the seed beetle. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, that's just a like general term, but that whole, you know, group of uh, beetles has really got it going on. But I understand, you know, your damsel fly. Yeah, fiction because yeah those are pretty cool i mean there's just a lot going on there it's, it's like technologies <laughs> it's, it's really inc an incredible piece of machinery what are these beetles i don't know anything about the beetles that you um know. the genus is colossobrucus and they're seed beetles and it's a, a species of beetle that um I think it lays it's I so I'm a vertebrate person, so just you know may, <laughs> bear with me if I fumble this in some way, but they they lay their eggs in um legume seeds, which you know watch out now from now on for your beans and so forth. Um and then the when they're they hatch the larvae, they burst out <laughs> the seeds and that's why they're called seed beetles, but they're not very cute. The beetles themselves are kind of dusty brown, maybe a little shades of green. But if you get close enough to looking at it, their their penises um that's really something to behold they have got their spikes and hooks and they're thorny and they've got like little jaw like structures on them and they yeah you know, they're they're very busy there's a lot going on there okay well now i guess we better back up i gotta ask you why you decided to write a book about this in the first place and then after that i want to um I, for for any listener that's never heard of uh, a penis with weird 
hooks and clamps and various other things on it before. I would love to get into explaining why that is and a bunch of those evolutionary mechanisms and processes that that shaped that. Um, so yeah, why did why did you decide to write a book about uh, about penises? I was in the process of a proposal on my book about the brain. And while I was sort of uh, making going through some rounds with that, I recollected that I had actually done a postdoc in urology with a U, not an N. And then that, that, you know, that what we were doing is we were looking where penises come from, how vertebrates develop them and, mm. you know, what affects their development and their length and their components and that kind of thing. And I thought, well, you know, there should be a, an entire book that's just fo- devoted to penises because does that exist? I was pretty sure when I went to look that I would find that it did. But it doesn't, not, um, you know, across the animal kingdom. There are books about genitalia, you know, in general, but not just focused on (laughs) this piece of anatomy. And Mm -hmm. um, I was really thrilled to find that because I thought this would be quite interesting. And then when I was deciding how to write about it, you know, because I mean, what are your choices here? You can make it kind of like a kitschy sort of like coffee table type thing with groovy pictures, you know, or you can make it have some kind of commentary associated with it. And I went with the latter of those two and so built some sort of sociocultural considerations around it as well. Wow. Fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it really, it seems like kind of a silly thing. Cause we all, from, from the time we're kids, we hear the word penis and it like makes us chuckle a little bit. And it's this taboo that we, that we don't talk about and, and certainly isn't taken very seriously. Um, at least not mine in particular, but, uh, it's a, it's something that, that anytime you talk about sex or something like that, it, it seems like it's usually associated with, low hanging fruit or low brow or this taboo thing we don't talk about, but there's so much, oddly enough, there is just so much that we can learn about all of the different evolutionary pressures that have created the existence that we are now in all from looking at a beetle or a fly penis, uh, under, (laughs) under a microscope. And, uh, and it's and it's something that it's it is uh, as someone who's big into um, talking about science and I love talking with scientists, but I also like talking about science to regular people when I'm not doing this show. And it's not always the easiest thing to do when you're uh, just hanging out with people. But people uh, people are into hearing about insect penises and stuff. It, it's a it's it's good uh it, it's uh, it's a good way to get people interested in science yeah it's a, it's a gateway structure for sure and, and to you know sort of the deeper issues uh related to like you have just already mentioned you know evolution and um so, and selection natural selection and subset of it that's sexual selection and all those kinds of things it's not like you can just be at a party and start going on about, you know, <laughs> what drives selection and what selection pressures are. But, and if you start with, you know, here's the sea beetle penis and you break out an electron microscopy picture of that thing and people are like, my God, why does that look like that? That's a great opening to, well, I'm so glad you asked that question. I have a lot to say about it. Let, let's get into that. Cause I want to know. And, and I love as, as much of, as much as I've, uh, read about a few of these things in the past. There's always new ones like the Beatles that I, I haven't heard about. <laughs> and it's always awesome to hear people um, uh, people framing the this subject matter in new ways. So uh, so hit me with some Beatles knowledge. <laughs> well, I, the, one of, so the subtitle of the book is Life Lessons from the Animal Penis. And one of the lessons is that if you're going to look at the penis, it, it behooves us to look at the other side of that calculatory equation. And I don't know how, I mean, you, you wandered around in the entomology world quite a bit, it sounds like. And yeah. you know that they can use that anatomy, right, to classify these species a lot of the time. But what I found was, I knew this sort of, but then I found, you know, there was the actual evidence to support it. It's not just my opinion that 
we tend only to look at that side of things and not the other side. And mm. one of the lessons is, is that the more components of features that a penis has, the likelier it is you're going to see something on the other side of that calculatory equation, right? That's driving selection for those components. And so if you're being biologically sound, you would expect, well, they always are looking at that other side and we haven't really been. We have not focused on that nearly as much as we focused on the penis side. And so right. I feel like that's a big gap and maybe you're know, not, not really following biological <laughs> principles very well when you don't try to look at what's driving selection for these really interesting features on these structures. Yeah. I, I once uh, read some, uh, some like it was years and years ago, but it was, it was like a 400 page. Um, I think it was more kind of an academic book all on, um, uh, I think it was called cryptic female selection or something like that. It was, uh, it was all, all much about insect, uh, lady parts and everything. And, and so I've tried to do my due diligence and, and research <laughs> the other side of it as well, but it is so fascinating that, that, yeah, as you said, you have these, uh, you have these, uh, when, when the guys in a given species have these super complicated, uh, kind of ridiculous or impressive looking, depending on your <laughs> sensibilities. Members, usually on the other side of that, you see some reason for that. Their lady has some sort of maze going on there, or there's just a whole right. bunch of uh, she's she's being really promiscuous, or there's there's uh, insects. Um, storing away like that have whole like sperm banks inside of them right. that they're putting yeah, the away right? the, the implication is there's some kind of tension right between the sexes um in yeah. the process of copulation and so you know if the female has more mates for example if she mates with several males then you might see this kind of very strong selection pressure on the components that the males are using you know, to mate successfully. And so kind of one of the patterns that you see, and this book illustrates this, I think, I hope <laughs> reasonably well, is that the more you see features like that, the more you can anticipate that there's tension in that copulatory process in some way. I don't mean tension like, you know, they're putting on little boxing gloves and duking it out, but just some kind of competition maybe among males mating with the female or there's not, they don't check a lot of boxes, right? To establish like physical intimacy beforehand. You know, they don't go through all these little processes and, you know, like, yes, you did this, I will do that. It's just like, okay, here we are, let's do this. And then they're done. And the more you see the latter, the more often you see you know, penises that have a lot of features to them, like the spiky things and the hooks of the damsel fly and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, is it? The, the one are uh, elephants got like a pretty interesting one going on, right? Uh, uh, are their females fairly promiscuous? Um, I don't actually I don't remember about the promiscuity. I don't like to use promiscuity because humans, we have such a moral valence to that word, but you know, they can have yeah, multiple yeah. mates. <laughs> multiple, I'm really trying multiple, to watch multiple mates. Yeah. yeah I'm trying to watch my language about, and also like things like cryptic, you know, which makes, the female side, she's being kind of sneaky in some way, you know? And yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah, really yeah. trying to, as a, as a biologist, I mean, this is language I've used in the classroom before, and I'm just trying to be more careful about it because language is so important. But, you know, elephants do have a thing that's almost from, I'm no elephant expert, but I did read up about this quite a bit. And it's almost kind of like a group effort in a way, because they're like kind of, it's like, the medieval um, practice of bedding the king and the queen, you know, like you get them in the room and there's just all this like ceremony about it and stuff. And elephants kind of seem to follow sort of a similar process of, you know, they, they do actually check a lot of boxes before they have that physical contact. And I would say considering their size, that seems reasonable <laughs> to have, you know, some steps you have to go through. Hmm. Um, yeah, th th that's interesting that you also talk about the language of things. Cause I, I just, I just decided to, um, look this up out of curiosity <laughs> was written by a guy and, and the title of the book was female control, sexual selection by cryptic female choice, yeah. which yeah, but like looking back, how, who knows how many years ago this was, uh, 
I say who knows, like that's an unknowable thing. <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, it's not pulling up for me for some reason. Yeah, but, I know the um, one you're talking about. And that's pretty standard language, right? What do you right. think of it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, it's know. great that you bring it up because I guess it's like it's one of those blind spots where sometimes when someone brings it to my attention, then I'm like, oh, yeah. That that does that does make sense because not not just not just in terms of being um, sensitive to how um, you know humans are feeling like they're being portrayed or whatever else, but mm-hmm. but literally in terms of um, shaping an accurate lens through which we're looking and researching the world. Right. I think it's, I mean, it may be be cryptic to us because we have very dull sensibilities and senses, right. when it comes to what's going on, but it may not be even remotely cryptic to the animals involved in it, you know? And so I think it it also, I think we tend to have this kind of, to borrow a sociology term, this kind of human gaze or lens, I guess, on things. And, and we, you know, we don't maybe have the sharpest senses when it comes to that kind of stuff. Right, right. right. That's a very good point. I, I'm curious, how do you, from this, I think this is a, probably something tricky to answer, but how would you tease apart when, say, looking at the evolution of some species at genitalia, how would you tease apart the difference between inter and intra sexual selection, you know, between uh, whether it's males competing with other males Mm -hmm. uh, in say sperm competition or whatever, or what tension there is between the male and female. That seems like such a (laughs) difficult thing to pull apart. Maybe you don't. Right. I mean, that's a big question. I mean, the usual division line is pre-copulatory and copulatory, right? And so if it's pre-copulatory, that tends to be inter in like between the males, right? So you know, it's big, if you're big antlers, look how beautiful I am, or, you know, how amazingly strong and that kind of thing. And if it's copulatory, it's where those the, the two structures are coming into contact. And so that introduces, you know, intrasexual interaction there. Um, even if it's sperm competition in the reproductive tract, there's still probably some contribution of the reproductive tract itself to what gets selected there, right? And so that does seem more intersexual than intra at that point. Um, even if they're having like a little sperm race or whatever <laughs> in the yeah. track. So, yeah. Huh. I wonder how much, I mean, it's impossible to know, but I wonder how much selection pressure has shaped something like, you know, uh, uh, has put so much, uh, uh, Maybe this is the wrong kind of way of thinking about it, and it's kind of after the fact and everything, but mm-hmm. it, it puts so much pressure on, say, making a sperm a little faster than the other sperm, edging out. that That's how you get to exist, and if you don't get to exist, then uh, who cares about the rest of it? But. How, what other amazing traits might we have if there wasn't so much focus on that first little race? Well, you know? I, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's something you can't answer, right? And everything is a trade-off, right? right. So those those intrasexual features that that you see, like we always think of males as having them, but I don't think it could be just confined to that necessarily, but. Yeah, you know, eventually it becomes a bit of a drawback to have giant antlers on your head, right? You're right. going to be conspicuous. You're going to get, t- I mean, all kinds of things that can sort of mess up your your reproductive success. And all of these things have a trade off. And even at the that you know cellular level of a gamete that wins the race, you know what the downstream trade offs of that are. Um, I guess probably is a mix, of course. None of this stuff exists in a vacuum. There's not just this one sperm trait that, you know, at, you know is, gives you your fitness. You know, that's not right, how that right. works. And so it's a combination of things even downstream of that as well, I'm sure. Hmm. Um, so so let's go back to the beginning. What was your, you said you wrote a, uh, what was it, a thesis? So you did, you did something on? And I did, um so I have a PhD in developmental biology, and okay. that research was focused on gonadal development and what determines whether the gonads will make sperm or eggs in vertebrates. And then I did a postdoc in uh, genitalia development, external genitalia, um, and what 
drives development of the penis um, or the clitoris and that kind of thing. And I have an English degree. So oh, wow. I, um, wish I didn't study either of those things. So what, what does determine the, <laughs> uh, the gametes? Um, so developmentally, the gametes have to make, I mean, the, the cells that are eventually going to start dividing undergo meiosis and make sperm or eggs, they have to go through quite a journey through the body. And when at the end of that journey, they will settle into one, either the center of a structure or the outside of a structure that's developing. And depending on where they settle and some factors that are in place that determine that, um, that have to do with steroid hormones and their affiliate proteins that interact with them, they will settle in and start to develop oocytes, or they will settle in and start to develop spermatocytes. And that mm. is something that is settled pretty early in development. And the switch for that process in animals like us, in mammals, most mammals, but not all, is the presence of a Y chromosome. Um, and it's not actually the Y chromosome, it's a single gene on that, which is sex determining region Y on the Y chromosome, it's a little bitty gene, and that kind of kicks it off. But that's not all there is to it. It's really complicated downstream of that, and there's a lot going on. So the mere presence of a Y chromosome does not define sex per se. Um, but if that gene is present, it can kick off a pathway that typically ends in you know, that the animal will make sperm. Mm. And do, do those ever, um, do, because there's, do those ever get switched at all? Do, do things ever happen? And it seems like, it seems like such an intricate cascade of mm -hmm. uh interactions that uh, that i imagine most of the time go in a pretty consistent reliable like stepwise fashion but it must it must get off once in a while take sure. a wrong turn yeah there, there are typical outcomes like you say and those i mean you could kind of consistently predict certain outcomes especially if you know, the the master switch um Developmental biologists really like to talk about master switches. It's like the thing that, you know, makes everything else happen, that in initiating mm -hmm. event. You know, if that occurs, then if everything is running, you know, typically, then you, you, know, you can kind of predict the outcome. But you know biology, right? You know how nature operates. There's never an always when it comes right. to biology. And there are all kinds of outcomes that are possible, including that those cells will take up residence in both areas and that the, you know, the resulting organism will make both sperm and eggs. So, you know, there, there's a range of processes that it's possible. Why doesn't, why doesn't that happen more? I mean, from, from the, why, why isn't everything just cloning? Why, why even <laughs> bother with sex in the first place? If the whole point is, is to pass your, your genes on and get as many of your genes out there as possible why in the world would any organism share their genes with some other uh thing and mix them up why not right. there, there's a lot of things that just completely replicate and that seems sure. like the way to go you just we're all just trying to make copies of ourselves well so that's a huge question and lots of people spend a lot of time trying to answer it but the kind of the, the, the fundamental response that i see for that question is that it's a mixing pad i mean sexual reproduction allows for just through the process of meiosis alone right two steps in that process allow for mixing up your genetic complement and so you're constantly just kind of, you know, just messing around with the template there and introducing new variants and new combinations. And then, you know, if those give some, you know, an individual or the individuals that carry them a little edge, then they get selected for and then they pass those on and, you know, they keep gaining that edge. And then, boom, all of a sudden you've got evolution in the population. And with asexual uh, reproduction, you know, that's that's not how that works. I mean, like you say the end point of that is that basically you've made kind of a little Xerox copy of the organism. And in fact, you know, mutations, mutations are what they are. They may do nothing. They may be disadvantageous or they may give an advantage, but generally speaking, if you're asexually reproducing, you don't mix it up too much, right? Bacteria, you know, they, they, they go nuts with that kind of thing because they swap <laughs> sequences and stuff between each other, but they're just different outcomes. And, 
I think the balance in the end just comes down to, well, which one is you know, favoring persistence of the species. Hmm. Why, why not more hermaphrodites and stuff? Why not, why not just do your own mixing and, and changing up the immune system just on your own or without <laughs> having to, uh, and outwitting those viruses and bacteria out there without having to go through all the trouble of finding a partner to mate with. Wouldn't that be fabulous? So actually there are a ton of hermaphrodites, right? So yeah. you know, tons and tons of them. Like every, there's so many invertebrates that, that I, they say hermaphrodites, so there's so many invertebrates that make both sperm and eggs, but even the, the species that do that, preferentially they don't self fertilize because what are you mixing up if you do that right you're not actually i mean you you're mixing people you're shuffling things around a little bit but not nearly as much as you would if you were to be shuffling and then share your shuffle with somebody else's shuffle right you know it's like a playlist it comes out very differently <laughs> if you're merging playlists than if mm. you know you're just kind of taking your own and moving things around a little bit to produce a new playlist Wow. I don't know where I just came up with that playlist thing, but yeah, that's the outcome. Yeah, that no, that's uh I mean, so so in most species where that's the case, it's like a last resort that that, that uh, individual could potentially make their own offspring but would prefer to mix it up with Right. I, I'm not, I can't assign preference, but it definitely seems, I mean, it's my understanding that in those species that could, could self fertilize, they will, you know, like you say, if conditions just are not tenable for finding a partner, mm -hmm. but it seems like finding a partner is definitely the more successful gambit. So why have a penis it's something i ask myself almost every day yeah. uh you know I, I i mean these things are you know it's like it's not the most convenient thing in the world it's kind of uh especially depending on depending on what species you are you're at risk of of uh of you know so another someone else attacking it or you know you it makes you vulnerable it's it's just uh it seems unnecessary and there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of species that don't have a penis at all right yeah um well there're a couple of great uses um for an instrument that can place gametes internally um if you're a land animal you know, you've only got a couple of options here because you don't have water to bring gametes together so a lot of aquatic species of course water can bring their gametes together i mean frogs do that most of them they lay eggs and then you know there's a little spawn and then you get the little fusion and then little frogs come you know we get little frogs out of that but you don't you can't you're a human you don't walk around and find an egg cache and then drop some sperm on it and wander off right we can't really do that on land and so one of the uses and there are many of a penis or a structure like a penis is that you can place those gametes internally and they can reach the partner gametes and fuse and make little new members of a species that's it's it's uh, safe it confines you know it keeps the eggs away from predators if they don't get laid i mean there are all kinds of reasons for um having it work that way and among them is that there's some partner selection going on there like this is a pretty distinctive thing to do with another organism, this copulatory act. It's a it's much more personalized than, you know, here's an egg cache in the water, and here's some spawning, or you know, what coral do or the animals a sperm cast, where it's just like psh, there they go into the water. You know, you're not really choosing a mate <laughs> when things go that route. But if you're choosing internal deposition of gametes. That's a pretty specific choice that's being made there. Yeah, that seems so strange um, <laughs> to be at the at the risk of anthropomorphizing too much, I suppose. But it, it is it does seem like fish would be well. Who, who knows what fish are and are not consciously aware of? Uh, but um, it's it seems odd. So many fish just probably have not even the slightest clue that what they're doing is leading to offspring or other fish i'm sure it just feels good to 
lay your eggs and squirt your gametes out in some area and then you just swim away and never really have to think about it and yeah i mean fish are interesting as a group i mean they have a range of things that they do right um there's kind of what you describe there are, are fish they're very elaborate in what they do like sticklebacks at least a species of them they they're very elaborate in making a little place where you know the eggs are deposited and then you know the 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 male comes through and drops off the sperm this is all very sort of uh, dictated behaviorally Mm. um cartilaginous fish the chondriacthes like sharks skates rays um they have claspers and that actually facilitates uh, internal deposition of gametes um, there are a few species of fish that have little penises <laughs> that they use as well. And so the fish are kind of mm. all over the place. And then, you know, they're the salmon. That urge for salmon is so powerful that they go, they do that, and they die. And Die a horribly right? stressed death, too. Yeah, it's yeah. Just... It's simul parody. You just give up everything just to get that, you know, get those gametes out, right? Cause, yeah. Because their, their stress response system just kind of fires into hyperdrive yeah. to get them up the stream get them past those famous photos and video of the bears that we've all seen mm-hmm. and then you get up there you do your spawning and then that that stress response system doesn't shut down yeah you just it just keeps got you just stress yourself to death and yeah. get riddled with tumors and whatever else right yeah, I mean it's it's that it is it's what they call a life history strategy, and it keeps little salmon um, being made. You make more and more little salmon, and that urge is powerful. They go through a lot to do it. There's a marsupial um, species or group of marsupials in Australia, the Antichinus, that is one of the only mammals I have heard of that does something quite similar, and it is of the stress hormones just are go through the roof and that those little guys run around and maybe with everything they can find, even though they're falling apart and then they die. Okay. Well, now I gotta look uh, and what's A N T E C H I N U S A N T E C H I N U S U S Antichinus. I got, Oh, cute. All right. Little, <laughs> Little yeah, mouse they thing. Are yeah, they look oh, like, you know, and then they just stress themselves they to death. They just fall apart. Oops. They measure cortisol levels. That's the stress and right hormone. It suppresses immunity, and they just keep going and falling apart. And then the males, you know, they just they, it just goes sky high. It rises and rises until it just flatlines, and then they're just dead. That's it. There go the males. Wow. <laughs> and you know, it's it's a life history strategy. It's a reproductive strategy that works for the species. Species is still here and seems to be doing okay what you want to do you want to die right when it's over like in the (laughs) act i feel like i don't i feel like you don't want to just be afterwards evolution's just like all right we're done whatever happens to you happens to you if you just are stressed for the next week and sure developing whatever tumors until your heart explodes or whatever who cares but there there's some there's some things that die like in the act right i mean i'm sure yeah i mean the praying mantis is of course famous right because um some proportion of praying mantis um and species of female does consume the male but that's sort of an ultimate version of what is sometimes called a nuptial gift, which is, you know, the, the, the animal that makes the eggs has got a lot of work to do. It's a high resource proposition to do that, to nurture eggs, to you know, nurture the new uh, individuals of a species. And so nutrition is the resource you need for that, right, for energy. And if that the male gives up his entire self for that, like you know, one of the ideas is is that provides a lot of energy for that, and in that way, ensuring some fitness for that male, like some successful yeah. reproduction and representation in later generations. Spiders are pretty well known for um, having a de- that kind of strategy as well, or some of them. Yeah, Australian redback spider. That's a fun one. <laughs> Uh, feeding itself to the female, yeah, having, to, yeah. having to do a dance to get to feed yourself to the female, to be yeah. spit out, to do a dance again, to yeah. do it. <laughs> There's a spider that rips off its own, one of its own body parts and then gets the, you know, mates the female and then she basically sucks the life out of it while, yeah. while the mating is going on. And it's, you know, but that's, 
Well, it's I like get it. Like, you know, you're desperate. You show up to dinner to you're trying to impress a lady. You forgot your wallet and you're like, I don't know, eat me, I guess. I, and and some ladies go for it. It's it's, it's so it's, it's so strange in spiders. Um, it's it's uh, there's speaking of num- numptual gifts in spiders. There's also all of these. Um, it, what is it? The nursery web spider that um, that puts together that that finds i think like usually they bring some sort of gift of food but they um, they wrap it up in in webbing or whatever beforehand and then and then sometimes there's not actually food in there they just they put in a dud and they wrap it up a <laughs> bunch and by the time and the lady's so excited to open her gift that sometimes the mating is done by the time she realizes that it it was uh it wasn't anything it was a fake. No. <laughs> There's uh there there has to be um it there there has to be such a oh that that's the other I was going to I hope I'm not jumping around too much, but going back to because you mentioned the uh, and this has to do with ha- not having a penis. You you mentioned the the famous duck corkscrew penis, um, and it is quite a sight to behold. If you if you look at the uh, a picture of it or a video, is I think there's a really good video online of mm-hmm. of someone using a tube to uh, measure it and artific- get it collect semen or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really quite impressive. It's like a Almost shoots out like a whip or something and it, pretty ballistic emergence yeah ballistic emergence is a perfect word for it but that it's not just unusual that this thing is so bizarre and has a ballistic emergence and is corkscrew and everything else but also what the heck is up with a bird having any penis whatsoever it's these things aren't terribly aerodynamic a, a lot of birds don't have penises at all right yeah 97 percent of birds don't use a uh, penis to transmit uh their gametes internally they use what's called the cloacal kiss um the cloaca it's is so latin, romantic right? sounding. yeah it's so romantic latin for sewer and this is just an all-purpose exit that a lot of animals have including these birds and to transmit gametes, they just bring those two things together, the cloacae together, and the, do the transmission. So that's what a lot of birds do. Um, there are some birds that have some kind of intermediate structure that does get aroused and does get inserted, but apparently it doesn't quite meet the bar for being a penis among people who like to parse this kind of thing out. But ducks and waterfowl, ostriches, those are the 3% of birds that do have something very, very, you, you know, that's a penis. And, um, you know, the ducks uh, that we're talking about engage in what's called forced copulation. They're just on there and they're just like comes out like ballistically and mm-hmm. it's kind of got a corkscrew shape. And the interesting thing about that is that up until this century, actually, there people have been talking about duck penises for a long time. <laughs> it's been going on a long time. I first became aware of like how into people were uh, into duck penises. People were like the, the mid 1990s, right? And certainly mm-hmm. they probably were into them before that. But it wasn't until this century until somebody decided to look at the female side of things. And again, if you see something like that, it's like, this is shaped like a corkscrew, right? This has all of these features. You would think, well, what is driving that adaptation? What's selecting for that, right? On the other side of the copulatory equation. And finally, and this may be the person who also put the video you saw online, um, Patty Brennan at um, you know, Holyoke in Massachusetts, finally went out and collected a duck when she was doing some dissections in um, the UK and actually published like i think the first sort of examination of a duck vagina and what you mm-hmm. find is that it also has a corkscrew in the other direction from the penis corkscrew and it has like cold the sacs and dead ends and things like that uh that sort of cold the sacs cold the sacs little sperm cold the sacs they get trapped they can't get out you know which is probably there's some selection going on there Right there on the ground in that wow. you know, reproductive in that tract in the genital tract, 
Huh. That's yeah, that's interesting. So and and then in in ducks in particular, I I think can't they in in those cases also isn't it isn't it often I don't know how well studied this is, probably pretty well studied, but it, isn't it often the case that the more of the forced copulation is usually from males outside of the group and and um and that that females females do have a lot more um selection like like females that meet a guy that they actually like can right. kind of straighten out a bit and uh make access easier yeah so i mean waterfowl pair bond right i mean you know like mallards for example they pair bond but i've also seen you know a group of mallards doing you know trying to uh, enact forced copulation on a female and it's just like a bunch of males and they were competing with each other and she clearly was not interested and was trying to get away from Mm -hmm. them and so i think there's this mix of things going on and i know that they've done studies to see you know why are ducks doing this like you know to to get at sort of some sort of evolutionary explanation in terms of reproductive success for why an animal would engage in forced copulation when you also see this kind of pair bonding. And they didn't find that forced copulation gave any advantage reproductively at all. And so my basic conclusion is, is that ducks are just kind of assholes and they're just kind of aggressive in general. And this is just another mm-hmm. aggressive behavior because it doesn't, that must benefit them somewhere outside of copulation because it doesn't seem to give them an advantage in terms of representation if they right. use for, if forced copulation is how they conceive. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of aggressive non-copulatory behavior going sure. on out yeah. there. Like uh, well, yeah, ot- otters do, aren't otters just forcing themselves on like other, on like some other seals or like some other... Th- I think otters are kind of weird and dolphins, you know, are sort of, you know, notoriously gropey, right, as well. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, vertebrate, our our interactions as vertebrates are kind of based on aggression or the the, the sort of lingering threat of it. When you get in an elevator, you don't go and snuggle up to the person in the elevator who's already on there, especially not now, obviously. But you don't get in an elevator and go stand right next to the other person, right? You create this distance between you. And I think that that's in part because, you know, a lot of what we do is dictated by this kind of aura of aggression that could develop. Um, hmm. So, so is the idea that aggression is having some utility in some of these species for other reasons and then they just kind of have this default aggression that then kind of gets uh uh, there's just like spillover into these other um aspects of that was that that was my personal speculation about it's like pleiotropy right where this this one effect that's selected for has this kind of residual kind of backpacking sort of effects on other things or there's just all these effects of this this one aspect of a trait that's being selected for but i mean that's just after reading a lot about ducks and their penises (laughs) and their behaviors and so Mm. on that was just kind of my speculation they came up with generally they're just kind of aggressive they're just sort of jerks (laughs) just kind of fighty in general so everything they do is kind of aggressive that way i can't wait to see the peer-reviewed paper that (laughs) <laughs> proves once and for all that ducks are assholes. Uh, <laughs> we'll <have to> see <laughs> scientific how that consensus. Right. Um, yeah, I just looked at male <laughs> sea otters um, herded harbor seals into the water and targeted them in the water by grasping them by their head uh, with their teeth and forepaws and then attempting copulation in the water. Mm-hmm. Who would have... It's you never suspect it. You know, you see those you, you see so that uh, otter like rolling uh, the mm-hmm. food around in its mm-hmm. thing and you want to feed it too and then you and then you get the painting of the majestic duck and like I'm going to put that in my <laughs> living room. And mm-hmm. you just and you just put a huge picture of an asshole in your living room. Like one of the one of the worst assholes on earth, really. <laughs> Well, non-human ones anyway. Not non-human, non-human. Yeah. Um, so how does 
how does some of these how does some of these selection processes happen over I know it takes just lots and lots of t- lots and lots of generations but how do you go from having something that um what, what is it a uh not coital kiss I want to say coital like cloacal. Coitus, but it's cloacal yeah. cloacal kiss how do you go from that to any kind of uh, bird with a penis, is it is it the case that, I mean, you see birds mate sometimes, and it's like, if if you didn't know what you were looking at, it doesn't mm-hmm. even look like mating. It happens mm-hmm. so fast. It, I mean, it can't be if you're just pressing two things together like that. It can't be the most reliable delivery <laughs> system is it is it maybe just the case that some species then yet over time you have a little bit of an edge by having like okay well if there's something that can go in there a little bit and then that starts the ball rolling on uh on kind of an I, yeah, I guess it's possible but the thing is is that they the penis is a loss in the bird taxon actually um they start to develop one like chickens for example start to develop the structure that will become a penis, but then it degrades, it disappears. Um, like we do a tail. It just, you know, it's like, eh, there it goes, it's gone. Really? And so there's clearly, you know, whatever the chickens are doing is working for them in this sense, because they you know, could, if what, if there were, you know, chickens to sort of, there were a mutation, they ended up making a penis after all, you know, and it didn't get, you know, disintegrated basically during development. And it were somehow more effective reproductively and improve their representation in later generations than that might be selected for. But we don't see that, right? I mean, chickens still do the cloacal. And it is really quick. It's like seconds. They do yeah. the cloacal kiss. And that's kind of it. So, you know, the, the opportunity is there. But and so far hasn't caught on again after the loss and that taxon. Um, hmm. So it's, so it's start, so, so ancestors of the chicken had a penis and then. So there's a really interesting story about that. The amniotes are a group of animals, right? That lay eggs that have the sacs. They have a chorion and an amnion and a lot of them have a shell as well. And at the base of that family tree, like the, the most ancestral living representative for us is the tuatara, which is the reptile in um, New Zealand, and it's the only member of its genus that, that still exists. And it uses a cloacal kiss. And for a long time, there was been so much argumentation <laughs> among people, the genitalia researchers that just like to argue about things, like you know, most researchers do. And what they argue about is things like, well, how many times did a penis arise in the amniote family tree and things like that. And there was a lot of dispute about it, which is understandable because if you look at snakes and lizards, you know, they've got those two headed penises, right? The hemi penis that you oh, know, look like maces and things like that. that. Thing has a hemi. Right? Yeah. And you look at, I don't know, like the echidna has a four headed penis. I mean, these things can get kind of outrageous. We're pretty bland by comparison, actually, <laughs> to yeah. most of the rest of the vertebrate family tree. Um, but, and then you look at the two atari. And they're kind of birdish. They use a cloacal kiss and for, you know, to bring gametes together. And you normally, if you wanted to find out, well, do they do what chickens do? Does the penis just kind of start up and then not continue during development? You would get two Atari eggs and you would look at that. But you can't collect two Atari eggs because they're deeply endangered. We have de- destroyed their, you know, habitat so thoroughly that they are at high risk. And nobody really could answer the question until they discovered these century old samples of tuatara eggs in a dusty old museum collection associated with Harvard and dug them out. And somebody had made slides out of them. And it just so happened that just like this very serendipitously, these two slides had captured this one point in development and the embryo wow. where that would be there. And it was there. They could see mm. that yes, they did start to make it. So that far back, because this 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 um, lineage goes back several million, hundred million years, like three hundred, how many millions of years? It's like dinosaur millions of years, and um, at least that far back, there were penises being made. And so that says that basically that's like little those instructions are there 
for amnios to use if it's somehow adapted for them and mm. it gets used for penises. Wow. Um, and what's going on with the, I just, you have me, you have me looking into all these other things now. Um, <laughs> there's, cause I just looked up the, uh, the echidnas and I forgot how <laughs> darn cute the echidnas are they're, too. They're and now such I'm, weird little animals. They make pink they milk. Are. I love them so they much. They make pink milk? Yeah, there's iron in their milk, so it's pink. Oh, and their babies cool. are called puggles. This is such a strange looking penis. And it's four not heads. like Yeah. They have four two heads. vaginas. Yeah, echidnas have two vaginas. So they use two heads of the penis at once and one vagina. I mean, these penises, they look like weird, like little suction cups or yeah. something. It, and mm -hmm. it looks like a, it almost looks like a paw, this picture that I, or like, it's, it's such a, it's a whole alien world we have going on under yeah. the echidna. That's so strange. Okay. So two vaginas. It don't, mm -hmm. I, cause I think like possums have some yeah, they stuff do. It's like a that going on my too, dream. Right? Early, yeah. Early mammal kind of thing to have those two vaginas. And two uterine uh, horns, too. Early mammal, kind of? <laughs> so they were the OGs? That was the first? Yeah, they, yeah the, the, the duplications and OG thing, the fusion came later to into one vagina and one uterus. Um, it's because of the way development goes with some structures that have to do with the urinary system. It's not, you probably don't get wow. into the details of that, but yeah. Oh, I love details. I don't <laughs> care. But because the, the, the human penis has like two, it's like two halves that are, did that, is that what happened? Is it like squished? Well, they have the spongy, the time? two spongy columns, the, the corpus cavernosa, I think maybe. Um, yeah, and then, I yeah, down the center of it is the uterus, but that, so the, oh my God, help me, the urethra. The urethra. The uterus. Can you imagine if you had a uterus and a penis? My God, what would it's, happen? It's, it would, that would be uh, bad. It's already such a mess. That would not be desirable. Um, no. But yeah, you know, the urethra runs down the center of those two, like, you know, in between those two things. But it starts out as something that is a split and feces and, wow. and a genital, yeah. So, wow. Uh, that's huh that and you look so at reptiles and they have the two heads there because they're that that still comes out as like a little fork <laughs> well now what's going on there is it see to me my my first my intuitive thinking is like well it doesn't hurt to have a spare we <laughs> already talked about what what um troublesome and, and potential danger penises are and and that they could be quite fragile and exposed um but that that's probably not not the case that it's a spare though it's probably yeah. for uh what's so what's going on why why two penises well, and, I just, and then the, and then if two is better than one why not eight penises well so i don't know that it's not so the evolutionary i don't think it's that two is better than one it's just that in this case but it certainly wasn't detrimental so at the very least it's just kind of been retained rather than selected against. And we mm. used to teach about erectile penises because they are they are so featured. They have so many very specific features to them, um, the snakes and the lizards do, that there must have been, had something to do with species recognition between copulating partners, like, you know, that you were sure you had the right <laughs> species because they're snakes, right? They're not going around going, well, I don't know. You've got, <laughs> you know, your stripes are not in this direction. This doesn't look like a Hershey's kiss. You can't possibly be a copperhead. That's not how they're thinking. And so, you know, the idea was that that this would help to match them up biologically. I don't mm. think that that now, it was kind of the lock and key idea. Like this was a key. It would fit into the lock. That meant that they were compatibly, you know, the same species. <laughs> it may be, there is probably more to it than that, but it there's, the fun news is that there are certainly plenty of questions still to ask and answer in that regard. Hmm. Um, so what, what else are, are penises used for anything else out there? Is it always copulation or does, does it, I mean, you have this whole other appendage and it just, <laughs> you can't carry anything with it. it it's, it's useless. Otherwise it, 
Yeah. Well, but it's not right. Um, there are there are species that do use them for other things. There are species that have penises and don't use them for copulation. So it can kind of go both directions. Like and what? I would say I would say that humans don't necessarily use penises for copulation, even mm. like all the like maybe I don't. I would have to see numbers on this, but I mean, how many times do you, I'm not you personally, but does a human being really just use a penis for copulation? I haven't once. I have zero kids. There you go. So, you know, and with the intent of, you know, copulation as a reproductive act, I mean, lots of humans are having sex with other humans with penises that the the partners are not going to reproduce. Like that's flat out just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And so penises are a tool for intimacy for us. They establish intimacy for us. Um, It's not just, let's just transmit some semen to a partner here and call it a day. We have lots of uses for it that go Mm -hmm. beyond this, that kind of anatomical framework. Obviously we also use them to get rid of uh, waste. (laughs) I mean, mm. most most people with penises do urinate through them, so that's another use of a penis. And other animals, um, along the same lines, there's a use of them for establishing intimacy, just kind of having a good time. Dolphins are kind of notorious for their behaviors in that regard. And then there are some animals that use other organs as penises, like they use their feet to transmit sperm. Um, they use that as the penis to get across millipedes. There are species of millipedes that do that, for example. Hmm. Wait, say that millipede thing one more time. <laughs> so millipedes have paired legs, right? That's how you know it's a millipede. And they use these two pairs of legs. They have, I think it's the eighth and ninth pairs. And one of them they're going to insert into the partner. And then the ninth pair they're going to use to source up the semen to insert. So they have a partner and they first, they poke in that eighth pair without anything in it. And the, I the, the inference from that is that it's kind of a test poke. Like, is this going to fit? Yeah. Cause again, millipedes, you know, they're also not going around your taxonomic checklist for partners. And then if that seems like that worked, okay, then they go to the trouble and expend the energy to draw up, right. The semen from the ninth pair into the eighth pair and then insert a new partner and transmit those sperm. Uh, and those are legs. They're going to pause. Yeah, pawns. okay. And, wow. Before you, before you fire. Because it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's, you, you don't, uh, you don't think about how energetically expensive it can be to, um, to work up a new batch. But no, all of it's energy, right? I mean, the four, what are the four F's? Every single one of them, if an animal's doing it, if it's expending energy on it, it's got to be one of the four F's, mm-hmm. right? Of which I forget. There's like, can I swear on your show? Yes. <laughs> right. Of so it's like feeding, fighting, fucking, or, and I always forget the fourth one. <laughs> What's Flight? the fourth one? Huh? Flight? Feeding, fighting, fighting, or fleeing. Right. Fling, so fling. if you're fighting with something, you're looking for food, you're looking to mate or you're running away you're from running. something. And all of that is highly energy intensive. So, mm. yeah. Hmm. Um, what about, um, oh, I just spaced on what I was about to ask. What about the, um, the uh, kind of, uh, so what about the the various sexual dimorphism that that happens out there between genders? Like humans have a little bit of it. Males typically uh, a little taller, larger than females. There's some species that have wild um, exaggerations. There's mm-hmm. there's ones where it, even the females are just enormous compared to the. Males too. I think that's another spider reference again too. Spiders, reptiles, some cephalopods. Yeah, the females can be much much bigger. What 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 was that? Cephalopods. Um, some cephalopods. Um, I, I, there's a paper nautilus. It's a kind of octopus, and the female is much much bigger than the male. Um, so much so that he. So they have um the male has they obviously ate arms because they're an octopus and. One of them, though, is one that can be released. 
And so they'll source up the um, the sperm that he wants to transfer. They're on they're they're called spermatophores, little sperm packets. They'll source them up um, into this arm and then sneak up to the female because she'll just eat him for a snack. She's about eight times his size. But wow. he'll just like drop his arm off inside of her under her mantle <laughs> and swim away. <laughs> so he leaves behind this arm. It's called a hectocotylus. Um, and so in that case, that's an you know, extreme dimorphism. There are barnacles that are like that. Darwin found a barnacle that he thought was, um, had little parasites on it. And then he realized what he thought were parasites were actually the male <laughs> of the barnacle species, which also had an enormous penis that he was super impressed with. And, um, reptiles, definitely the females tend to be bigger in part because they are the ones that they, they carry the eggs and they've got, have all the resources for that. And just also, they're just bigger size for that purpose. I mean, barnacles do have impressive penises cause they're, they're stuck. They're stuck in one yep. place. Yeah. So they yeah. just send a thing out there, just kind of feeling its way, <laughs> way around. That's. Yeah. That's uh, that's amazing. I I mean, I feel like I feel like at the end of the day, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of existence, at least on, on the male side of things, certainly is is just kind of blindly feeling its way around a <laughs> dick first. Uh, the, the barnacles have like they go like 300. It, Aren't they like 300 times the size of its body or something like that? They there is a away. species that has the proportion to body size has the longest penis on earth. And it is many, many times it's, it's tiny, tiny little body size. It's a really teeny little barnacle. So oh. yeah, they could get quite long. And there's um, an interesting thing. There are studies showing that, that wave force can select for how thick the, penises are for some barnacle species like if they're in wow. high wave pressure the pieces become thicker so they can withstand you know that wave force and not get sheared off right so speaking of difficulty sure. with having that and there are uh, quite a few um, species of animals where the animal that makes the eggs is the one that has the insertable organ and I and, they, and some of them they quite literally are feeling around in the dark because they're cave insects and the animal that makes the eggs inserts an organ into the partner making the sperm and draws up the sperm into their body to fuse hmm. with the eggs. And of course, that's all in the, they're in the Brazilian cave insects. And there are other species that are like that as well that do that. Cool. Brazilian cave insects. Yeah. And Neotrogla is the genus, I think. They're not very so, cute. So they insert. <laughs> Like a vacuum, basically. Yeah, it's a draw. They're drawing it. They, they insert an organ. And it, there were all kinds of reports. So for this book, I came up with a, a word for these organs that get inserted because there's so many different names for them. And you know, for the damselfly, right, they call them ligula, right? There are just so mm -hmm. many different names. And um, the act of the insertion is called intromission. And so I just call these organs intr an intromitum because it's what gets intromitted. And in this case, these animals, the, the cave insects, they, you know, the ones that make the eggs, they do the intromitting. They put that intromitum into their partner. And instead of depositing gametes, they draw them up. Yeah. Mm, wow. Um, well, I, I want to make sure that I don't forget to go back to the beetle from the beginning, just because <laughs> just because it was your favorite. So <laughs> I I want to hear the whole I want to hear the whole rant. I want to make oh. make a case for me. Making a case. Okay, so first of all, you'd have to see the um scanning electron microscopy images of I'll look this it up. beetle. Colossobruchus, C A L L O S O B R U C H U S is the genus. Um they've got some pretty famous genitalia actually. And one of the things that's really interesting about it is the interaction of their the, this this penis with what happens in the reproductive tract of the partner because it damages the tract um, and kind of leaves wounds. So this Oof. is you know it causes physical damage. And so then you ask the question, well, you know, if it's damaging the partner, what utility does that have in terms of reproduction? Because it seems like physical damage would be deleterious, right? Kind of prevent you maybe from continuing on with the reproductive process. Yeah. But it turns out there's a pretty good sized semen deposition 
And it may be that these wounds allow nutrients from that natural gift from the male uh, for the female to use more readily than if they were just deposited in the tract and without wow. this damage. And so they show that, they, you know, the, yeah, they, the females maybe don't live as long, but they do reproduce more successfully. Wow, that's as a result fascinating. Of that. Yeah, because if you Google it, the mm -hmm. first thing that will come up, uh, <laughs> the first search result is horrific beetle <laughs> sex. <laughs> And then yes. the second one is traumatic beetle sex. Yeah, they call it traumatic, you know, which I think that's a human interpretation of it, right? But yeah, yeah. I mean, it does cause physical I mean, trauma to the tract, so. It probably yeah. doesn't feel good. I mean, it's tough to say. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a sea beetle, so. Yeah, yeah the, I guess. I mean, yeah. I know I'm not, actually. It's, yeah. it's a, yeah, I mean. Well, I guess we get into like weird SM SM stuff. I didn't mean to use the word weird and uh and past judgment, but yeah, that that is that's such a fascinating idea that I sometimes think about is is just how uh, not just the physiology of say evolution making gametes and all these, but also then how it how it shapes our drives and our desires and how something, how something, I, you know, why certain foods taste great and, mm -hmm. um, and others don't. And same with, uh, same with sex. I always, I always think that, you know, if, if sex feels so good, so that will reproduce sometimes when we often are actively trying to avoid having children but still want to have sex um because sex feels so good why didn't it make it feel why didn't evolution select for uh, people who sex felt better for there must have been there's no reason why it couldn't feel better or l less good but it it feels exactly as good as it feels. I mean, I'm sure there's a range within people and there had to have been some range where at a certain point, if sex felt better, you, you just wouldn't be able to do anything else or, or you would, you would, it, maybe you, you would make poor choices or, or something like that there. You know what I'm trying to say that there always has maybe to be some kind sort of, of. I mean, and you're you're saying that if it if it went so far, it, you know, it would be another trade off situation. If it went so right. far that it were something that it all that the individual organism wanted to do, and somehow there were lots of organisms and it was all they wanted to do, then maybe that would be to the detriment of survival and actual reproduction. Yeah. I mean, there are you know the there is a primate species of bonobos that use um, sex. What we and for our sex behaviors as social behaviors, they're pro-social behaviors. And I think that and this is this my speculation largely, um, just based on a big ton of reading that I've done. I think humans use these things in kind of a similar way a lot of the time when we conflate behaviors that are, you know, potentially reproductive with behaviors that are pro-social. And I'm not quite sure where that line is when mm. it comes to that. And so there are, I think, benefits to what we view as sexual intimacy that go, obviously, that go beyond something that has to do with reproduction. I think that there are other benefits that are kind of pro-social benefits for us in a way that's kind of similar to what they see with bonobos. So, hmm. Yeah, are, are bonobos ejaculating when they are uh, Yeah, there's, you know, they, they have um, the female bonobos, they, they, they scissor, basically. And yeah, they do seem to do that to the point of orgasm. And, um, and you know, there's just, it, it reinforces a social bonds. It's a, it is a social bonding kind of thing. And clearly it's not for reproductive purposes if it's between, you know, two members of the same sex in that species. And we're not, we're separated from, you know, our closest cousins by many millions of years, 6 million mm -hmm. years. So you, know, you can only go so far with making these kinds of comparisons, but we've layered so much morality onto behaviors involving our anatomy that I think we've kind of lost sight of what the potential explanations for those behaviors are. Mm hmm. 
What's so you mentioned that humans um, often kind of if you look around doing research for a book like yours, you notice that that humans um, genitalia is actually uh, somewhat boring compared to some of these things with hooks or foreheads or whatever. Do you, do you ever have you seen some species? They probably don't stick out to my, uh, the mind if this is the case. But are are there some species out there that you find to just be the absolute most boring uh, <laughs> uh, species in terms of genitals or in terms of sexual behavior or whatever? Yeah, I mean, the pattern is that you know, the fewer features you see, the more likely it is that they do go through a lot of processes to achieve intimacy. And so when you do see what you would consider a boring penis, which I mean, ours doesn't have a lot of features, even compared to other primates, we, we don't stand out at all. We don't have spines, for example, um, and a lot of primates do have those. We don't have bones and other primates do. Um, but for us, that means, of course, that we can do all kinds of things with a penis that maybe some other animals can't, you know, I wouldn't see a sea beetle and having a great time, you know, <laughs> with the penis like that in various other places that you can put them. Um, and so that is kind of a benefit for us, which again, I think shades over into kind of a pro-social aspect of having that organ. And the only other animals I can think of where you're just kind of like, yes, that's, that's what that looks. Yes. That's still what that looks like. Yeah. That's still one of those is kind of cetaceans, like a, some of the whales. I went to the Icelandic biological museum, which has got a lot of disembodied animal penises in it. And, um, I, I write about it in the book and having kind of mixed feelings about being in there. Cause I'm somebody who likes to see the whole animal and what's happening with it and what's going on and not just a part of it. Maybe, but all the whale ones all kind of look sort of the same. <laughs> they, um, they're kind of conical in shape and they, I'm, I'm sure if you look at them very closely, you know, they're distinguishing features, but just from a distance, especially in formaldehyde, what you see there just starts to be kind of the same little cone over and over again. <laughs> um, mm. I'm not saying that's boring, but in terms of just kind of uh, conformity, they, that's the impression I got from that. So when you, when you were exploring life lessons, um, what are some of the, what are some of the bigger takeaways for uh, maybe, maybe the listener out there that doesn't, isn't as impressed by learning about <laughs> hooks or, or, uh, feeding yourself to a female or all of these strange things that I think are just endlessly fascinating, mm -hmm. but people out there going, what about me? How does this benefit me specifically? Um, right. what do you got? I have a couple of things. Um, one is I know that you're probably aware since you're on Twitter as well on other probably corners of social media that when we talk about who is supposed to quote unquote have a penis and who isn't and who is allowed to call themselves a woman or a man and that kind of thing that people do this appeal to they they they, they turn to biological essentialism and on one side of the argument people say well nature only made a male and a female nature only made animals that make eggs or animals to make sperm. And that's patently untrue. So, I mean, you can take that biological essentialism argument and just say, no, it's not at all the case. There are plenty of animals to make both. There are animals that like the cave insects that have, you know, an, an anatomy that looks very penile that they insert and draw up, you know, gametes from a partner. There are all kinds of mixes and matches and all kinds of things going on in nature. We really like to have things in a binary, like two buckets is about all we can handle, but that's not how nature does it. And and nature has all kinds of ways of doing things. So that just, just dispense with that entirely. Um, but the flip side of that is also we shouldn't be necessarily appealing to that kind of essentialism to explain ourselves because like I mentioned earlier, we're the only existing member of our genus. We have no existing cousins. Um, I don't know what we did to them, but they're no longer here. And our closest living relatives are separated us, separated from us evolutionarily by six million years. Mm -hmm. And so when we want to look around and say, well, this is what humans should be doing, or this is what, you know, is a human thing to do. 
well, kind of, sort of, for good or for ill, what we are doing is a human thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so we can fall into a trap of saying, well, nature does it this way. Well, we are nature. And what we're doing is, in most respects, what humans do. And that takes me down to the claims that people make about um, if uh, to be a man, you have to have a penis. And if you have a penis, you're a man. Mm -hmm. And we are much more complex than that. And as a species that stands out for being the only living representative of its genus, we are the only ones with brains like ours. And what mm. really makes us stand out is not our penis, which by the way is in a 22 way tie with other primates in terms of length. <laughs> we don't even like win. We don't, we went on no counts whatsoever, but our brains 22, 22 way, way tie. tie. I know, but our brains are unique. There's not another mm. homogeneous brain out there. We're mm. it. And I think if we focus on that and look at the manifestations of that and appreciate how unconstrained we are behaviorally compared to so many other species, that that's where we need to focus and not so much on the penis. I know I wrote a whole book about them, but there's a bit of a Trojan horse in there, plus this message. that mm -hmm. that's It's not the case that a penis makes a man and every man has a penis. So mm -hmm. I love it. Um, you said you had three things oh well, well, there three, I thought I said two well the, the, the oh, final one well no I'm, I'm happy to trot out the third one which is language I think we have to watch our language you know we already had a little bit of a discussion and I had to do this too I had to recalibrate mm -hmm. how I was talking about things not just sort of like oh down with the patriarchy or you know oh yay go you know this is misogynist although it has some elements of that but in terms of being precise and being accurate yeah. and how we use it and I agree. And also not using it as a slur. And so I, I, I wrote an op-ed about this, but one of the things that people do who consider themselves progressive is they see somebody engaging in a behavior that is sort of primal, maybe, comes across as, um, I don't know, a psychologically simplistic, uh, like a guy in a Starbucks with a you know automatic weapon hanging off of his body. And mm -hmm. they'll say something about that person. They'll say, oh, small dick energy. With the implication mm -hmm. that this person is is performing because they're they are not satisfied with the size of their penis, and I mean that's that is so limiting on the human construct and so limiting on what we really need to understand about a behavior like that, and because you were never going to get at figuring out what the hell is making somebody do that if all you do is say oh tiny dick and move on mm -hmm. instead of understanding that that person's performing for an in group. And wants to get accolades right. from them, you know, and all the other elements associated with it. So mm -hmm. I think we need to be careful in characterizing people and reducing them to a penis alone. Mm. Um, as I just finished the last season of Dave on FX, the rapper Little Dicky, mm -hmm. uh, whose whose entire career was launched rapping about his small penis. <laughs> Much, much smarter and really, really creative than you would think from a name like mm -hmm. uh, Little Dicky. He's a very clever, artistic person. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. But just pop, it's <laughs> just funny that you say that as I just finished that show. Um, so, all right. Um, did you, was that two or three? That was only two, right? <laughs> that was the you third had, one, yeah. Oh, that yeah. was the third one? That was the third right. one. Well. I'll tell you what, the the last thing that I'd like from you is if you could just, um, just because uh, I, um, I, I do want to have you back on to talk about your new book when it comes out in December, mm. if you're, if you're interested, yeah, sure. um, uh, be happy to have you, but could you give us a, just a, a quick, uh, I know it seems like a tangent, but it's another book that you wrote, <laughs> The Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your children's first four years, as long as you want. But if you could just give like a, a two, three minute plug wrap or, uh, about it just to sell people on it. To have about the parenting book or about the brain book? About the parenting book, or or both, actually. Uh, the parenting book is about five years old, so um, I'm happy to sell people on it. It is uh, it's a science based look, like it says on the tin. Um, what we did with that book, I co-authored that with Tara Haley. Is we instead of saying you know you should do this or you should do that, or here's a kind of a parenting kind of psychology approach to things, or here's the one way to do things, we just looked at what the science said. 
and um, gave the conclusions of what the science says and trust the reader to take those and fit them as they need to their own mm. personal family experience. So that's what that book is about. Um, the Taylor Brain is the one that's coming out in December. And it's actually similar in the sense that I'm not offering, like, here's one weird trick to make you get the brain that you want. Instead, I'm saying a couple of things. First of all, there's not a one weird trick. I'm sorry. Um, they're just, they're, there's sort of a triad of things that we can do that are pretty accessible for a lot of people that will help. And the other thing is, is that we need to shift the focus from our, our own brains, just ourselves and consider this interaction of our brains and the brains around us because we are a social species and mm -hmm. that matters. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've been as, as someone that, you know, been a pandemic and everything, and I've been uh, really safe about COVID and, and I just tend to, uh, I tend to like being by myself. I, I, well, my life's so weird because when you tour for 17 years, you're by yourself so much. And then you're by all the people. All, it's mm -hmm. like, well, it's like social life on steroids for mm -hmm. a few hours and then by yourself for days or whatever. And, um, and so I consciously, the, uh, like the experience of being alone um but lately this summer i've realized because I've, I've had some low points and bits of depression which i was usually would have hit me in the winter and didn't mm -hmm. so maybe it was just finally catching up with me or whatever but whatever happened i i had some experiences recently um where i was finally catching up with friends and and stuff and seeing friends in person rather than talking with them on the phone and i was like oh i don't hate myself <laughs> i've just been alone so much and ruminating so much yeah and, exactly and yeah. It, it and it's like being around a, a, a group of friends or whatever i was like oh i i have great friends and yeah. And, uh, and they like me and I like, and it's, it's, uh, it's interest that, that idea of the, the social brain is, is, um, is, is something that's, that's sometimes lost on me, even though I've, you know, I've read some about it and everything, but I, I, I forget how important it is. Yeah, I, I tend to do that too. I like to be alone, actually, a lot of the time. But in writing this, I realized, you know, there are there are certain relationships I take great. Um, I, I I I just enjoy that they exist. It's not like there are hundreds of them, right? But the ones that are there, where we share cognitive load and you know interact in that way and support each other, those are there's no greater gift I think than that. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the show. And listeners, I hope that you'll check out Emily Willingham's uh, books. We, of course, we do the one we talked so much about today is called um, Fallacy, Life Lessons from the Animal Penis. Um, we also just plugged the Informed Parent, a science-based resource for your child's first few years and uh first four years sorry first four years and then the uh the new one coming out in december and possibly we'll be able to get her back on to talk about it the tailored brain from ketamine to keto to companionship a user's guide to feeling better and thinking smarter yeah that would be a that would be a cool conversation to have um yeah. in a few months uh so sure. uh yeah but, but thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me and for um, being patient. <laughs> well, we got a, got a time to make it happen. Oh, I mean, it's all of my guests are such busy people. It's, it's uh, people that are into science and scientists are always just such hardworking, <laughs> dedicated people that have such tight, crazy schedules all the time. So yeah. nothing unusual there, okay. uh, believe me. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy that it did finally work out. So, uh, so yeah, you're a wonderful guest and thank you listeners for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week.